Hello all, welcome to the Palm Biosensing session. I am Imran Chima, an assistant professor at Lahore University of Management Sciences, Pakistan. I want to thank my biosensor team comprising fantastic researchers, Dr. Tatwik Chalyan, Rai University, Brussels, Belgium, and Dr. Essin Sukulu, Montreal Clinical Research Institute, Canada, for their efforts in organizing the session. Before, before we get started, just a quick reminder to all of you to type your questions into the Q&A box throughout the talk and upvote the questions you think are more interesting. In this session, we have an exciting lineup of talks for you. We'll start with our plenary talk by Dr. Maria Soler, who is a senior researcher at Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, Spain. She is a recipient of various awards, including the Extraordinary Doctorate Award and the Pioneer Award. She is currently leading fabulous research for developing novel nanophotonic sensors for immunology-based diagnostics and personalized therapy applications for cancer and infectious diseases. Uh, so uh, over to you, Maria. Hi, hello. Okay, let me start presentation. Can you confirm that uh, you see it? Yes, uh, we can see everything. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you. So yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me. Well, good evening from Barcelona. And uh, just congratulations for this uh, great meetup that you organized. Uh, so I would like to give an introductory section, section to, to our nanophotonic biosensors. And I will specifically talk about the work we are doing for COVID diagnostics. Uh, so first of all, uh, I would like to introduce a bit our group. Uh, we are the Nanobiosensors and Bioanalytical Applications Group at ICN2 in Barcelona. Uh, we are led by Professor Laura Lechuga, who probably most of you will know. And uh, as I said, we work with nanophotonic biosensors, but um, we put much effort in developing the, the applications for environmental and biomedical purposes. So we have a very multidisciplinary team. So we are physicists, we have engineers, chemists, biologists, and also even mathematicians and programming uh, personnel. And I would like to remark here that being an engineering-based uh, research group, uh, most of us, we are women, which unfortunately um, this is uh, a bit rare in our field. But uh, let's go into the research. So for those of you that are not in the field, a uh, biosensor is an integrated device that is composed mainly of a transducer that is in close contact with a biorecognition element, um, such as antibodies or DNA probes. So when uh, this bioreceptor uh, captures or detects a specific analyte that is present in a sample, a series of physical chemical changes that occur in the transducer are readily uh, transformed into readable signals. So for photonic transducers itself, what we measure is changes in the light properties, such as intensity, wave, wavelength, or phase, for example. We specifically work in our uh, group uh, with uh, evanescent field uh, photonic biosensors. This uh, evanescent field is a certain type of an electromagnetic field that occurs at the sensor surface and that uh, penetrates with a decaying intensity on the dielectric medium when the, where the biomolecular interaction occurs. Uh, the, the evanescent field is very sensitive to refractive index changes that occur at the sensor surface, uh, such as a change of mass. That allows us to detect uh, any biomolecular interaction uh, with a, in a labeled free format uh, and also in real time. Uh, the conventional sensitivities that we reach with this type of biosensors are between 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8 refractive index units. And uh, an asset of our biosensors is that it can be applied to 
virtually any type of uh, analytes. It means proteins, nucleic acids, small molecules, peptides, or cells. Also, uh, due to this simple operation procedure, uh, these sensors have a high potential for integration in portable and in small devices that can be used at the point of care. So, in particular, uh, in our group, we're working with two main uh, type of biosensors, one's based on nanoplasmonics, uh, surface plasma resonance, uh, and also in, with waveguide interferometers, in particular, our bimodal waveguide interferometer. So, um, this uh, surface plasma resonance is uh, one of our simplest but most beloved technology, actually. Uh, we have uh, several prototypes that we develop in-house and we use them uh, routinely in the lab to uh, develop uh, surface chemistry procedures and also a lot of applications to, to diagnosis, to therapy or to environmental control. Our sensor uh, is um, it's not like the commercial Biacore device that um, most people know. Ours is a small, it's portable, it's the size is kind of a shoes box. We have uh, two channels to work in parallel. And uh, we also develop all the electronics and even a customized software that uh, we can use in the PC or also with a tablet. So um, we usually uh, reach 10 to the minus C refractive index unit with our device. This translates into nanomolar to picomolar range for biomolecular assay. And as I said, yeah, we use it um, just uh, every day for a lot of applications. But also in parallel, we also work with uh, nanoplasmonics. This is nanostructured surfaces. We have investigated a lot of uh, nanoplasmonic structures. Uh, maybe more relevant are the nanoslits uh, and these na gold nanodisks. Uh, we have developed uh, an established, an established a very cheap and simple nanofabrication protocol. So we, uh, we can explore different sizes and geometries for the nanodisk to achieve the best performances. Uh, and the good thing is that uh, we can employ these gold nanodisc sensors in uh, very compact and uh, uh, simple devices, also user friendly. Uh, we are developing as well a multiplexed uh, biosensor device for these uh, nanoplasmonic uh, sensors. And uh, this uh, sensor, we expect it to be kind of the SPR uh, prototype that I showed before. But uh, the, our start in the laboratory is the bimodal waveguide uh, biosensor. And this is a, an interferometric biosensor. It's uh, similar to the well-known Max Sender interferometers or the Young interferometer. But the main difference is that we don't have the Y junction that splits the light into two different paths. Instead, what we have is a, a single planar waveguide uh, that at the beginning, it only allows the fundamental uh, mode of the light uh, to travel. And then after a certain distance, there is a nanometric grip that uh, excites the first mode of the light. So two, two modes, the fundamental and the first mode travels along the waveguide to the, to the output. The main thing here is that only the first mode of the light have an refractive an electromagnetic field and an evanescent field that extends out to the surface of the chip. So uh, it's the only one that is in contact with the sensor area. That means when a biomolecular interaction occurs on the sensor area, only the first mode of the light will sense this uh, change of the refractive index, while the fundamental mode remains uh, the same within the core of the waveguide. Then at the end, uh, because of a phase change in the first mode, we will find an interference pattern that will be uh, proportional to the change of the refractive index in the sensor surface. Um, 
with this uh, uh, by, by model web interferometer, uh, we have reached uh, outstanding sensitivities. Uh, we have reached between 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 9 uh, refractive index units. Uh, this translates into femtomolar to atomolar concentrations of, uh, of analytes. And uh, also, it is important that uh, we work in the visible range using low power laser sources. And uh, we fabricate our chips uh, based on silicon microtechnology processes. So uh, we believe that uh, this type of uh, devices have a very high potential for Labona chip integration and uh, point of care biosensor devices development. And this is actually what uh, we are doing. Uh, we are working in parallel in, in the whole engineering areas of, uh, of the biosensor. So we work on the sensor chip fabrication, but also in developing polymer microfluidics and microfluidic cartridges for multiplexed uh, detection. We also work a lot on the optimization of the surface functionalization. Uh, the packaging and storage of the chips after the biofunctionalization. And of course, uh, we continuously try to improve and enhance the lighting coupling, the signal processing, and the automation of the, of the whole device. So this is the technology that uh, we proposed and we are using in the Combat project. That is what uh, I would like to talk to you about. So the Combat project uh, is an European project that uh, we are leading. And it was granted in February uh, last year, right when the pandemic started. So the Combat um, was as a, as a response to the first uh, European call uh, that uh, for combating the COVID-19 pandemics. What we propose is to use uh, these uh, nanophotonic biosensors for rapid diagnostics and the surveillance of coronavirus. The project, uh, as I said, we are the coordinators, but uh, we collaborate with coronavirus experts, one of the most experts uh, people in Europe. Uh, they are from Barcelona, in, from the University of Barcelona, from France, the University of Marseille, and also clinicians from Italy. Uh, that they are experts in the diagnostic of infectious diseases. So the main aim of a uh, combat project, as I said, is to develop a biosensor for detecting uh, rapid and with a uh, high sensitivity the, the coronavirus, right? Uh, so the, our applications with this, uh, of course, are the early um, diagnostics of patients and the population screening. But as a plus, uh, we want to use it to monitor the evolution of different uh, coronavirus in animals. So we can, in a future, prevent uh, future pandemics of outbreaks. So what are we doing in combat projects? Uh, our idea is to use one single platform for all the analysis that may require. So the first approach is the direct virus detection. Uh, we want to detect uh, the, the whole virus entities uh, from respiratory fluids or saliva samples in a 15 minutes or say. Uh, our sensor uh, will give us the highest sensitivity and also with a minimal invasive assay. And uh, our plus here is that we can quantify uh, the viral load in the patient. That means that uh, if a patient has a high viral load, uh, the clinician can manage it uh, better and try to prevent uh, cellular symptomatology. The second approach is a PCR-free genomic analysis. For this, uh, we target the viral RNA uh, and uh, we plan it as a confirmatory test for an accurate uh, diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 SARS infection. 
but uh, also we want to implement this uh, type of analysis as a multiplexed analysis. So we can discriminate in one single assay if a patient has uh, COVID, uh, has the flu, or has a common cold, for example. And uh, this, as I said, we want to do it without PCR amplification, so the total assay time will be approximately 30 minutes, and we will not need uh, any laboratory equipment. And finally, although it was not planned uh, initially for the combat project, we are also addressing the serological assays. This is the quantification of the antibodies that the patient uh, generates in response to the infection. Uh, we think this is uh, of extreme importance now, uh, also not only for uh, uh, having an effective uh, epidemiological studies that uh, will uh, help a lot by having a fast and accurate uh, way to detect the antibodies, but also for vaccine evaluation and for controlling uh, the immunity, the acquired immunity over long times. Uh, so I, I would like to show you uh, none of my results that I will present here are uh, published yet, but uh, I think uh, it, uh, was to, it's worth to, to share it with all of you. So for the first approach, the direct virus detection, we plan it as a one-step assay. Uh, we select uh, antibodies directed to the spike protein of the coronavirus and immobilize it on the sensor surface. Then we simply flow the sample over the sensor and we read the signal. Uh, for that, uh, in the laboratory, we started working with a pseudo virus that is not infectious, just for our own safety, of course. And uh, with uh, this system, um, we check the affinity of the antibodies for the S proteins and also the specificity. We got a, a very high specificity with no cross talk with other type of viruses. And the sensitivities that we got for the pseudo virus were in the range of uh, 10 to 2 to 23 viruses per milliliter. Uh, these levels are more or less uh, are comparable to the limits of detection that uh, current PCRs in the hospital are achieving. So we are uh, well positioned in this uh, sensitivity in this sensitivity test. Okay. And then, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, we received the real uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, samples in our laboratory and they were inactivated. They were inactivated through a uh, UV treatment. And I wanted to mention that because a lot of people is using the thermal inactivation for the development of the, of the assay. And uh, we confirm that by thermal inactivation, you completely destroy the virus structure. And this is not only reducing the sensitivity, as you can see in this graph, this is non-treated, this is uh, treated at different temperatures, and this is with UV. So it uh, reduces a lot the sensitivity of the assay, but also uh, it may carry problems of reproducibility and reliability of the assay. So with these samples, what we are doing now is uh, trying to, to optimize the, the assay, the real assay. And I can advance that the sensitivities that uh, we are reaching are much better. Uh, last week in the laboratory, they showed me that uh, we are detecting a few tens of uh, viruses in, in a sample. So we expect to start with the validation in clinical samples in the following months. And then for the next approach, I'd like to explain a bit uh, how we plan to, to implement it. Uh, first of all, what we need to do is to select the viral genes that, uh, that we want to target. And then we design a complementary DNA probe that we will immobilize on the sensor. And for the detection of the RNA, uh, we will extract it from the virus. This is just breaking the virus. And we will go through a bit of uh, through a easy fragmentation procedure that can be done outside the lab. Then we flow this sample 
over the sen uh, sensor and the RNA of the virus will hybridize to the complementary probe. Uh, this uh, capture of the viral RNA fragments uh, will give us a signal. Uh, we trust in the high sensitivity of our device to be able to uh, directly detect the specific uh, viral RNA without the need of any uh, preliminary amplification that will uh, cost time and resources to the to the clinicians. So for now, what we did was a bioinformatics study to select the best regions of SARS-CoV-2 that will not cross talk with any other pathogen or any other molecule that we may have in our body. We check the affinities and the selectivity to detect this. Uh, this we did it with uh, an SPR biosensor and we have reached a nanomolar concentration already. So when transferring it to the uh, by model waveguide biosensor, we expect like at least one or two orders of magnitude better sensitivity. And what we plan to do, as I said before, is to implement this uh, multiplexed biosensor. So what we are doing is uh, uh, detecting at the same time uh, SARS-CoV-2 viral genes, but also influenza and human coronavirus, That's, as you see. Uh, on the external surface, they may be very similar, and uh, especially for the human coronaviruses that are responsible for common cold, we may have uh, problems of cross-talk when going to the S uh, protein target, but not uh, analyzing the, the, the virus genome. And also, uh, what we will do with this approach is to uh, do a multiplexed uh, biosensor detecting uh, whether they, they have a beta coronavirus or alpha coronavirus, and that will allow us to monitor uh, animal samples uh, like bats or rodents and try to surveil them and detect early if uh, there is a possible dangerous uh, beta coronavirus that may create a feature of so now to finalize uh, the serological assay, uh, the, the serological assay for implementing it, what we did was selecting a specific viral antigens, the N protein and the S protein of the virus, and uh, functionalizing the surface with it. With that, we directly uh, flow blood serum or plasma onto the sensor, and we will detect and quantify the specific antibodies that are present on it. Uh, uh, we have reached uh, very high sensitivities in the nanograms per milliliter uh, range. This is actually two orders of magnitude below the required levels for the, for the detection of antibodies. And we uh, seen this uh, very good results. We right away uh, went to detect uh, the to to evaluate uh, clinical samples that we obtained from nearby hospitals. And as you can see here, this is just a few a few samples. But we could uh, perfectly discriminate between COVID positive and COVID negative patients. So what we are doing now in the lab is a much higher clinical validation samples between 150 and 200 samples. And we are uh, uh, yeah, thinking of technology transfer actions. What that, and that means, as you may know, to get funding for industrialization and, and commercialization of the sensors. And that's it. I'm not sure about the time. I may be very fast. <laughs> But uh, I want to finalize just uh, thanking the COVID team in, uh, in my group that we have been working uh, nonstop actually uh, since, the, since February. We did not stay at home for the harsh lockdowns. We continue to go to the, to the laboratory and work on it. And also to thank all of you for your attention and I will try to answer any question. 
Thank you, Maria, for, for a really excellent talk. There are actually many questions here, and uh, let's pick a few questions uh, in the interest of time. So I, uh, uh, the first question was on your uh, biomodel waveguide design, uh, where one of the attendee asked, what kind of laser uh, did you use and what kind of detector and how uh, were you coupling the light in and out of the structure? Yeah, so we are using just laser diodes. Uh, we work at six, uh, 670 nanometers. So just with laser diodes, uh, we can work. Also with helium neon that we had before, but uh, we are trying to miniaturize everything. And as a detector, we are using just photodiodes and checking the intensity in two different regions uh, for detecting this interference pattern. The coupling of the light uh, is direct. We, we investigated some grating couplings, we investigated some vertical tapers and some other strategies. But right now, uh, we just by uh, approaching the laser diode, the fiber to the, to the chip, it's directly coupled. And also the same with the detector, just uh, placing the detector uh, right at the uh, light output, we, we can detect it. Uh, so there is another question on the, on the same design. Uh, is which is the microfluidic channel design you are using? Which is the flow and flush protocol? Do you need an external laboratory pump system or you can integrate it into the instrumentation itself? And, what, and which is the liquid volume needed to perform a complete analysis? Okay. So yeah, right now we are working with uh, PDMS microfluidics that we develop ourselves in the, in the laboratory. We have a few designs, one with uh, bigger channels and one with uh, smaller channels that we are trying to adapt to uh, each uh, waveguide. So one channel per waveguide. And in this way, we will have up to 20 sensors per chip. Uh, and uh, we are working Right now, uh, yes, with uh, syringe pumpers and everything, but uh, we have already done some work in collaboration with uh, people at the RMIT in Melbourne, in Australia, uh, that uh, we developed an automated microfluidics with specific valves and everything to have the buffer and injection valves all in the same optofluidic uh, cartridge system. Okay, then the, I think the next question was the volume that we were needing. Right now, uh, the sensor areas are uh, for 15 nanoliters of uh, volume. But this depends on the amount of sample that you choose. So the minimum will be this 15 nanoliter, but we currently employ between 50 and 100 microliters. And uh, let's move to your uh, next design where, uh, where you were looking at uh, COVID virus. So the question is, uh, uh, great project, Maria, good luck. Do you know the dimensions of the binding sides of the virus? What is the uh, longest uh, dimension limit of the sensor surface? Yeah, the sensor surface is, uh, I think, 15 millimeters. So we will have more than enough room for a lot of sensors to, to attach there. This, uh, these uh, viruses are uh, around 100 nanometers diameter, 100, 120, and antibodies are uh, between 10 nanometers. So yes, we, we have a, a lot of room for them to, to attach. Okay, so, so we have actually a lot of more questions so, but we are out of time. So maybe uh, you can respond to those questions in, in the Q&A session uh, box. So once again, thank you, Maria, for, for this uh, fabulous talk. Uh, and, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. Uh, thank so, you. So reminding the, the audience uh, throughout the talk, you can uh, type your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, and then let's uh, move to Italy now where we have uh, Federico Sala, who is a PhD student at the Department of Physics in Polytechnic University of Milan. 
Uh, and he's doing some exciting work uh, on optophilic biogems. So over to you, Federico. Thank you very much uh, for coming. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, I think I'm sharing my screen. If you can confirm that you are seeing my presentation. Yes, uh, we can see. Perfect. So good evening, everyone. I'm Sala Federico from Politecnico di Milano in Italy. And today I'm going to present you my work on the integration of light sheet versus microscopy on an optofluidic biochip. Okay. Perfect. So I will start with a brief introduction on the microscopy technique and its integration on chip. Afterwards, I will move on the microfabrication technique that we used to fabricate all our devices. And then I will focus on two uh, different cases for two different types of samples. On one hand, single cells, and on the other hand, drosophila embryos. I will end my presentation with conclusions and further perspectives of our work. Light sheet versus microscopy is a particular type of, of microscopy technique in which you excite the fluorescence by shining the sample with a plane of light. The, uh, the, the fluorescence emitted by the plane is collected by uh, the a detection objective orthogonally, plane by plane. By moving either the sample or the um, light sheet, you can scan through the whole volume and then obtain all the fluorescence from all the planes. This technique is inherently fast because you can acquire fluorescence plane by plane if compared, for instance, to, co to confocal microscopy that acquired the fluorescence point by point. And then by stacking together all these planes, we can obtain a three-dimensional reconstruction. Moreover, it, is, it has low photo damage and low photo bleaching since we are shining light only on the section of the sample that we are looking at. On the other hand, the complexity in the alignment of the light sheet and the, 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 mount, the mounting and the, and the alignment of the sample can reduce the actual throughput of the technique. Our solution is the integration of light sheets directly on chip. So we start from a simple piece of glass where we can add a microfluidic system in order to continuously deliver the sample one after the other and to position them precisely onto the detection area. We can add integrated optic in order to focus the light coming from a light source, in our case, an optical fiber, uh, onto the detection channel. So focusing the light sheet that crosses the detection channel, and then we can perform a light sheet first microscopically, flowing our sample in, in the sketch cell through the light sheet, and then acquiring the fluorescence with a standard button uh, uh, micro microscope. The fabrication technique that we use to, to realize all these elements is called femtosecond laser micromachining. We shine a femtosecond pulse laser into a transparent material, for instance, glass. Because of nonlinear interaction, we can induce um, material modification only inside the focal volume of the laser. We can induce some different type of modification, for instance, a change of the, of the refractive index. By translating the focal volume inside the glass volume, we can then laser write integrated 3D photonic circuits or waveguides. Another type of modification is called nanograting and allows us to realize three-dimensional geometry. When we expose the modified material to acid attack, we can then selectively etch it out and then realize embedded microchannel with three-dimensional arbitrary geometry or even micro-optics. With this, we have all the elements in order to realize our device with our light sheet for, uh, first microscope on chip. Let's start with the, the, the scheme for uh, a single cell dual color analysis. We have our two, uh, two external tubing that connects to a microchannel. <clears throat> the, the, the sample then can flow I will try to use a, okay, a laser pointer. The sample will flow through the microchannel. We have an external optical fiber that is coupled to an embedded hollow lenses that focus the, the light into a light sheet of two micron thickness. We can then collect the fluorescence from a bottom detection window with our microscope objective. 
our, our uh, device can be mounted on a standard inverted microscope using a high-speed CMOS camera to acquire the fluorescence. The light is coupled from two different laser sources into a single optical fiber that is directly pigtailed to the device. And the flow of the sample and uh, its velocity is precisely controlled with a high precision pressure pump. Here you can see a picture of our device ready to be mounted on our setup. And you can appreciate that this dimension is less than one cent, one cent coin. We used our device to acquire three-dimensional reconstruction of single cells. While the, while the cell flow through the light sheet, we can acquire several planes with a resolution approximately similar to half a micron. And as you can see from the images, we have a resolution that is uh, sufficient to recognize the, the features that are inside the nuclei of the cell. In, in this picture, in particular, the nuclei are represented in red. Here we have a video of what the system see while the cell flows through, this, through the light sheet. And here you can see a reconstruction that you obtain when you stack together all these planes and you, set, and you make a section on a perpendicular plane. Even in the reconstructor plane, we can still appreciate the geometry of the nuclei, for instance. We implemented also an automatic acquisition so that the system could work for minutes, even hours, without an operator intervention and can acquire up to hundreds of cells per hour, taking approximately 0.1 second per cell. Here is a sketch of the system that automatically recognizes the cell and save it, uh, save only the region of interest. Let's now move on on the second example. That is uh, the same type of device, but developed for uh, the study of Drosophila embryos. This type of sample is totally different. There's a much bigger dimension, 500 microns by 200, and they're also it is elliptical in shape. The main challenge in developing a device for this type of uh, sample uh, consists in the scattering due to the, by the, induced by the tissue of the sample itself. The two main drawbacks could be the degradation of the light sheet quality while the light sheet crosses the sample so that we have one half of the sample that is less illuminated and also the aberration introduced in the detection path by the scattering of the sample itself. The two solutions that we found out to circumvent these problems are to implement a dual side illumination and also to implement a passive orientation of the sample along its uh, smaller axis in order to reduce the effect of the aberrations. The dual sign illumination has been implemented by duplicating the lens system on both sides of the microchannel and integrating some laser written waveguides in order to guarantee the precise alignment of the two uh, light sheets. This is an image of the two light sheets of the two light sheet that are practically uh, totally overlapped over an area of 500 micron by 400 micron and with a thickness of 12 microns. Concerning the passive sample orientation, we, uh, we have engineered and optimized the microchannel shaped in order to introduce a control perturbation in the flux and automatically orientate the elliptical sample along its uh, in a horizontal direction, we can say, when it crosses the detection, air, detec the detection plane. This uh, orientation is totally passive and is induced by the flow of the buffer itself. So here we have a picture of our device when mounted on our experimental setup. You can see the two optical fibers on both sides and a pipette tip that substitutes the external inlet tubing of the previous sketch that I've shown you a uh, few slides above in order to directly uh, inject the, the sample with a standard laboratory pipette tip. And then we have a syringe pump in order to uh, withdraw our uh, sample. Here we have several examples of different planes of different samples where the nuclei of the, of the cells are marked as small dots. And here we have uh, a video of the sample that crosses the light sheet and it flows uh, towards our direction. So as a conclusion, 
uh, I've shown you how we can realize a versatile design for to integrate light sheet first microscopy analysis directly on an optofluidic device, totally integrated, and how this type of, uh, of design can be tailored uh, to the different characteristics of the sample, thanks to the versatility of the fabrication technique that is femtosecond laser micro machining. Concerning the first example, that is single color, dual co single cell dual color analysis, I show you how we are able to obtain a three dimensional reconstruction with sub nuclear level resolution and how we can implement an automatic acquisition of hundreds of cells per hour in order to screen out a whole population. Concerning the Drosophila embryo device, I show you how we, can, how we integrate a dual side illumination in order to overcome the scattering of the sample and how we engineer the micro channel in order to orientate as we want the sample during the acquisition. The further perspectives of this type of these devices, in, for instance, the, of the device concerning the single cell analysis, is the, the employment in the study of cancer cell population heterogeneity, and in particular in the investigation of tumor markers related to the three dimensional organization of proteins inside the, the nuclei. A further step would be the integration of more advanced microscopy technique on the same type of platform, for instance, lattice uh, structural illumination microscopy, in order to push further the ultimate resolution of the system. So let me uh, thank uh, the project I am involved in that is called ProCheap, my collaborators from CNR and the Polytechnic di Milano, and all the members of the consortium. So thanks for your kind attention. If you are still interested, here you can find the link to our social media or even the website. Uh, thank you, Federico, for a, for a very nice talk. So there are a couple of questions uh, uh, for you. Uh, one, what kind of aberrations, uh, specific aberrations were present in your system? Okay, the type of aberration could be two, if I, I'm trying to show you, okay, uh, this supplementary slide. We have two types of aberration. One may be introduced by the, the glass channel itself. So we shape the channel in order to um, match the numerical aperture of the, um, of, the, uh, of the detection objective in order to reduce this type of aberration, even though, even though we can have uh, some small effects near the edges of the microchannel cross-section. On the other hand, uh, we are, observe, we are um, uh, imaging through a big volume of uh, water and also a cover zip glass. And this can introduce a spherical aberration. In order to reduce this type of aberration, we used uh, index matching solution in order to, um, to raise the, the refractive index of the buffer up to the level of the surrounding glass media in order to uh, reduce the, the, as much as possible our spherical aberrations. Thank you. Uh, uh, there's another question. Uh, which dyes do you use for the fluorescence measurements? What are you studying inside the cells? Okay, uh, we used, uh, for, the, for concerning the cells, we used uh, some uh, immunostaining uh, on the um, um, alpha tubulin of the membrane, external membrane, that was the... Um, uh, the green one. I'm moving back to the to the correct slide, and uh, um, we marked also some uh, chroma some chromatin loci inside the nuclei, just still using immunofluorescence. And it was Alexa 488 and Alexa 561. For concerning the Drosophila sample, we used the. Uh, um, uh, we used several different type of samples, and this, the, the one that I'm showing you in the slides were, um, uh, were expressing genetically uh, fluorescent probes inside the, um, the nuclei of the, of the cells and uh, on the um, muscles, on the muscle cells uh, uh, structure, the, the video in the bottom. But I don't remember the precise loci code. Uh, there is another question. Uh, how does your technique compare 
to the current state of the uh, art uh, floric channels uh, where people use uh, these kind of uh, cell identification. Okay, um, we are talking about the microscopy, the microscopy technique or the fabrication technique. Okay, I will answer for both. Okay. Uh, concerning the fabrication technique, it allows to, to, to fabricate cells with a um, microchannel with three-dimensional structure spanning from uh, five microns to hundreds of microns. So it's uh, really uh, at the edge of the, te of the technology. And also in glass medium, that is really good for biological application. Concerning the microscopy technique, uh, it allows... Uh, high image quality and uh, actual good throughput and uh, low photo bleaching and high resolution. If we compare to uh, other techniques like cytofluorimetry, we are much slower, but uh, we are not simply detecting the cells. We are actually acquiring a whole three-dimensional reconstruction with high resolution. So we can say that we are uh, at the almost at the same level at uh, microscopy technique that work on fixed sample as, as resolution, but we can uh, uh, acquire hundreds of cells continuously without uh, need to change the mounting media or thing like this. Great. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Uh, what do you think uh, the, uh, uh, the challenges are there for your technique to transition it into the clinical settings? One uh, main challenge could be uh, this, the typical challenge of uh, microfluidics, that is the connection to the outer world, that is the use of external pumps or connection with tubes that are quite easy to be done in an experimental lab, but when we move to clinics, it's need, it needs a um, dedicated setup. On the other end, uh, for instance, you, if we were able to use much simpler pressure pumps, like in the case of the drosophila embryo, where we use a simple syringe pump, um, one, okay, uh, it, we can say that it would be quite useful for clinical application, even though we still need to and to increase the concentration of the sample in order to have a continu effective continuous delivery and uh, um, obtain a statistical relevant number of measurements. Of course, when we moved towards clinical, obtaining a high number of, uh, of samples, for instance, of tumoral cells, uh, could be a, different, uh, uh, a difficult issue, in particular for, in the study of tumors and so on. So we probably need a um, stage in order to concentrate the sample to be integrated in the, in the microfluidic circuit, or even an external protocol in order to concentrate it before uh, injecting inside the device. Okay, so I guess now we are out of time. We have more questions, but I think we are out of time. So once again, thank you, Federico, uh, for a fabulous talk. And, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the next talk uh, is by Alexis Scholz. Uh, she is a PhD student uh, in the Biomedical Engineering Department at the University of Southern California. And she is doing some, some really highly impactful uh, diagnostic tool development uh, especially very useful for low resource settings. So over to you, uh, Alexis. Great, thank you. Um, whoops, sorry. All right, you all can see my screen? Yes, I can all see right. your screen. Great. Um, Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Imran and the conference court organizers for having me here today. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the design of an optical malaria diagnostic system that is optimized for use in low resource settings that we've developed here in the Armani lab. So malaria persists as a highly prevalent and often fatal disease worldwide. According so maybe to you, Imran, want to, uh, uh, you want to expand your screen so your notes are visible. So maybe you want to expand your screen. Sorry. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. 
Uh, all right, where was I? So according to the most recent World Malaria Report, malaria is still endemic in 89 countries worldwide, um, putting 3.8 billion people at risk of infection. In 2018 alone, there were over uh, two point, sorry, there were an estimated 228 million uh, cases that caused over 405,000 deaths. These deaths are particularly tragic when we consider the existence of treatments that are almost 100% effective if they're administered early into disease progression. So now there are a number of reasons for these, uh, for this, but we'll focus on the diagnostic side of things, as obtaining an early and accurate diagnosis is key to treatment efficacy, but can still be very difficult to come by, especially in these low resource settings where malaria is endemic. And this is due in large part to limitations of current diagnostic technologies. So the current gold standard for malaria diagnostics is light microscopy, which is when a technician takes a slide of blood, stains it, and then manually counts the number of malaria parasites present. So although this is an accurate technique that can be used to screen for malaria, it requires expensive equipment and technician training, which severely limits its availability in these low resource settings. So to counter some of these limitations, rapid diagnostic tests have been developed. So these are based on chemical antibody sensing, which allows for point of care use as they can deliver results in about 15 minutes. They're widely available and they're inexpensive. However, they do rely on these chemical reagents that can be unstable in tropical environmental conditions, and they have a lower sensitivity, which can result in failure to detect early stages of the disease. More importantly, a recent World Health Organization report has actually called into question the reliability of some of these tests. So what we're proposing um, overcomes many of these limitations. So our system relies on a magneto optical detection of a byproduct of the malaria parasite um, that's been integrated into a point of care screening device. So our design allows for high throughput testing because each test um, only takes about a few minutes and has a low cost. The system is designed to be both fully portable and fully automated, so it requires zero training to use. And in addition, um, we've demonstrated high sensitivity of the system that we believe will allow it to be effective even at the critical early stages of the disease. It will also screen for multiple species of the malaria parasite. And ultimately, we believe it will be able to provide information on the parasitemia level of the patient, which is the concentration of the parasite in the patient's blood. So we believe that this system will allow us to pull the accuracy of light microscopy and the accessibility of the rapid diagnostic tests into a single system, filling the gap in the current solution landscape. So before we can talk about exactly how our system works, we have to understand um, the life cycle of the malaria causing parasite within the human body. So infected mosquitoes pass on the parasite to people through the saliva in their bite. And the parasite bides its time in the liver, reproducing until it's ready to be released into our bloodstream. And from there, they can enter our red blood cells where they break down our hemoglobin to synthesize their own proteins. Um, however, this process creates an iron containing byproduct called heme, which is extremely cytotoxic to the parasite. So in order to survive, the parasite converts heme into its non-toxic crystalline form, which is known as hemozoan. The parasite matures and continues to reproduce um, before eventually bursting out of their red blood cells and continuing on to infect new cells. So the key point in the life cycle for us is the production of this byproduct called hemozoan. So what is hemozoan? Hemozoan is a rod-like crystal that ranges from 300 nanometers to about one micrometer in length. And while the crystal morphology varies a bit by species of um, the par specific parasite that we're talking about, all hemozoan exhibits super paramagnetism, which is the property that we will take advantage of. Um, so for example, here's an SEM image of hemozoan on the left um, as produced by the most common uh, malaria causing parasite. And on the right, we have an SEM image of beta hematin, um, which I'll refer to more later in the presentation, but beta hematin is the standard synth synthetic mimic um, that we can use to just avoid um, handling actual malaria infected blood as much as possible and reduce the risk associated with working um, with you know, these samples. So we're sensing this super paramagnetic nanoparticle that's known as hemozoan um, that is again created when the parasite digests the hemoglobin of our red blood cells. So healthy patients don't have any magnetic substances in their blood, which allows us to leverage the magnetic properties of these hemozoan to screen for malaria based on the presence of hemozoan in our blood. So we do this by taking a blood sample, ideally from a finger prick, but you know we'll discuss that more in later, more in depth later, and we place it in a cuvette. We then shine a light source, which in our case is a 635 nanometer laser to apply some initial intensity of light to the sample and then detect the intensity of the light that passes through that sample. And this allows us to use a really simple form of differential optical spectroscopy where we're detecting this change in intensity as a change in power. 
So our test begins by taking an initial baseline period, which is currently set to about 30 seconds, where we measure just the power transmitted through the blood sample with no external perturbations. Then we apply a magnetic force, which results in an increase in power transmission in the malaria infected blood samples, which is shown here by this red line, um, but not in healthy samples, which are depicted by this black line down here. And the reason for this is actually pretty straightforward. Um, in our blood samples, we have the contents of red and white blood cells. And in infected patients, we also have these magnetic hemozoan particles, which are shown here in blue. Um, also note here that the laser beam path is shown in yellow just for clarity. Again, we're using a red laser. Um, and when we apply the magnet, these magnetic hemozoan particles get attracted to the magnet and pulled out of the path of the beam, which allows more light to pass through the sample. Um, but in healthy patients, again, we don't have these hemozoan particles, so we see no change in power transmission um, when we apply the magnet. So the premise of our test is pretty simple, um, and we previously built a device um, that you know utilizes this that uh, implements this test. So we can see the idealized rendering on the right. Um, as well as the actual setup that we built and tested with on the left. Um, so again, the system checks many of the boxes that we believe are necessary for a successful malaria diagnostic that can be used you know, in the field in some of these low resource settings. Um, so for those of you who were at the career panel yesterday, this was the project that Sam McBurney was referencing. Um, and as part of her work with it, she was able to characterize three very important sensor characteristics. So the first um, was measuring the lower limit of detection. Um, so Sam was testing with beta hematin that was suspended in either polyethylene glycol or whole rabbit blood to more closely um, mimic a uh, malaria infected blood sample. Um, and she was able to find that the lower limit de of detection for our device is um, 0 0.087 micrograms per milliliter. Um, so when we look at the data in general, we can see that as we have decreasing concentrations of hemozo or hematin, I should say, in our samples, um, we do see decreasing changes in optical power that are that is being able to transmit through our sample. Um, and this agrees very nicely with some of the modeling that was done by Dong Yu Chen, um, which is shown here as the shaded regions. Um, so you know, as far as the differences between testing in PEG versus whole rabbit blood, um, you know, we can see that the blood cells are causing uh, more noise in our signal, but we can see that our overall results um, still agree very nicely with our models. Sam was also able to show that the working range of our system includes the clinically relevant range of hemozoans. So that's about uh, less than one to five micrograms per milliliter. Um, and again, this is very important to show that our sensor can in fact sense what we need it to um, in order to translate eventually into the clinic. Um, lastly, Sam was able to show that if we took the same sample and tested it repeatedly, um, we got reproducible test results, um, which again, consistency is very important for um, an eventual diagnostic. So from here, the next step to bringing the system to the world is validating it with an animal study. So for this, we are in contact with collaborators at Emory University's Malaria Host Pathogen Interaction Center, where they already study malaria infected primates. However, for these animal studies that we have planned, um, in order to take that step forward, we actually needed to take one step back first. So our initial version of the device that I showed earlier uses a larger sample volume um, that would only allow us to draw blood from these primates about once a week. And this would have a direct impact on the quality of our studies as we had planned to monitor hemozoan levels with daily blood draws. So in order to do that, we need to reduce our sample volume size from the initial 500 microliters to the amount of blood that you can obtain from a single finger prick, which is about 200 microliters. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that 300 microliters doesn't seem like a lot of liquid, but it actually required us to fully redesign our testing setup. Um, so that's what I've been working on in the past year, in addition to actually making this a fully, you know, fully portable self-contained system that we could, you know, send to someone and have someone who's completely untrained on it um, use effectively. So in pursuit of these goals, um, you know, we've gone through a slew of prototypes. These are the two current working prototypes that we have right now. Um, they're driven, they're, um, these, you know, these changes are mostly driven by changes in the magnet we're using. So the first prototype, um, this is very similar to the initial prototype um, that Sam used for her testing, uses a permanent neodymium magnet. So think super, super strong fridge magnet. Um, and then a switchable magnet, which um, is a, a magnet that's in specially designed housing um, that contains magnetic shielding so that when we rotate the magnet, we can effectively turn it on or off. Um, so the switchable magnet or switchable magnet allows our prototype to be smaller, significantly decreases the footprint of our device, as well as the power requirements. So it has some big advantages um, 
but just because it's more different than our initial prototype, we're currently moving forward and testing with both of them still. So to talk a little bit more in depth about how each of these work to give you a better idea of what's actually happening, um, we'll first talk about the permanent magnet prototype. Um, so this is a, you know, a rendering of the device. We can see the user interface on the top. It's really simple, um, just some buttons and then a, you know, a text screen that spits out your results. Um, so as far as actually running a test on here, um, the user would open up the lid, um, slide a cuvette down to the bottom. This bottom part, um, to note, the box is clear just for illustrative purposes here. This bottom part is fully um, self-contained and closed off. And then to actually run the test, we'd take our initial baseline period, and then our motor will actually physically slide our magnet into place next to the sample in order to apply the magnetic force. So again, this prototype's a little bit bigger. It does require a little bit more power. So we're exploring the use of this switchable magnet. Um, so this box is actually pretty small. So, um, you could hold it in your hands super easily. Um, the testing setup here is largely the same, um, but our magnet is now static. So it's actually positioned behind um, the cuvette here. And in order to turn it off, it's or turn it on, it's really simple. We just use a servo motor and rotate the magnet within its, again, within the magnetic shielding to allow the magnetic field to escape the shielding and actually affect our sample. Um, so again, this this prototype drastically reduces not only the space requirements, but also the power consumption and the cost of our system. Um, so we're further optimizing the design. Um, so we're currently moving forward, as I mentioned, with validating both these prototypes. Um, and you know, to kind of touch on how we reduce the sample volumes, really simple again. Um, on the left, we have what we were using in the initial prototype. We we're using a micro cuvette um, with the laser beam aligned towards the top of it to avoid scattering off the sides of the cuvette. Now we're using a standard cuvette um, and just aligning the laser to pass just over the bottom of the cuvette, which conveniently aligns um, itself to be about 200 microliters um, in terms of the volume of fluid that's required to get that. Um, so on the right here, we can see initial data that was taken with the neodymium permanent magnet prototype. Um, and this was taken with iron oxide nanoparticles since that's what we had on hand. Um, unfortunately, with lab shutdowns related to COVID, we've had some delays in testing um, our prototypes. But moving forward, we are hoping to validate both prototypes with iron oxide, first with iron oxide nanoparticles, since we have them on hand across a wide range of concentrations and a wide range of sample volumes to validate that you know, our system does in fact work. Um, and then we'll validate with the synthetic hemozoan mimic beta hematin that I mentioned earlier. And then hopefully we'll be able to take those next steps to actually getting this technology out in the field moving forward with an animal study. Um, so I'd like to, you know, acknowledge and thank, of course, my advisor, Dr. Andrea Armani, um, as well as Sam McBurney and Dong Yu Chen for their previous work on this project, um, as well as everyone in the Armani lab, um, and of course, the POM organizers for the great conference and the opportunity to speak today. Um, so thank you all for listening, and I'll now take any questions. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, uh, this was a wonderful talk, and we have a lot of questions uh, for this interesting uh, project. Uh, first question is, I understand you are using nanoparticles to target malaria. Can this technique be easily translated to diseases other than malaria, such as COVID? So one thing to note here is we're, we're not actually making the nanoparticles. We're not introducing anything new to the human body. We're leveraging a naturally occurring magnetic nanoparticle um, and naturally occurring in the sense that it occurs because of the malaria parasite. Um, so, you know, it could, I guess, potentially be used um, as, or a similar thing might be used to treat other diseases, but you would have to, you know, go through the testing of is, are the nanoparticles safe to put in the body first and, you know, all the things that go along with putting, introducing something new to the human body. Okay, great. And what's the cost of this total system? Um, so the total cost, I actually have a breakdown here, sorry. Um, Right now, it's at about um, $1,050 for the neodymium magnet prototype. Um, but with the servo prototype or the switchable magnet prototype, the cost drops by about 100. Um, obviously, this is like for a single prototype. Um, you know, we, th we think with production, you know, you could decrease the cost of, obviously, you decrease the cost of anything. Um, so right now, we're looking at about $1,000 for one prototype. Great. Uh, uh, but there's another interesting question. Uh, is it possible to get anything else in the blood interfering with your signal, depending on patient's condition? Maybe patient is infected with something else. And, and so will your 
uh, signal deteriorated or what? Um, so that's kind of the point of us taking an initial baseline period. So if we go back to the slide that shows the test, um, this initial baseline period is kind of is, is meant to normalize our signal to whatever um, you know the patient has in their blood. Um, so like any of these red blood cells, white blood cells that are hanging around um, in the blood, we're, we're when we actually look at our signal, we're really looking at the change in power between um, you know, the end power transmission versus that initial power transmission, if that makes sense. So as long as the patient doesn't have any other uh, magnetic substances in their blood, those are, that's the only thing that should change when we apply the magnet. Uh, is there any particular reason for choosing a 635 nanometer laser? Uh, can anybody use it like a telecom wavelength or, or some other wavelength? Um, so this was part of the testing, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, Sam McBurney did. Um, she found that she got the best uh, results with a 635 nanometer laser. We also wanted to pick something that was readily available and low cost again, right? You can get a really cheap red laser diode um, because then we're trying to put the, use this in a low resource setting. So all the things we use, we want to be readily available, easy to replace, low, as low cost as possible. Um, so it's a combination of you know, initial testing with different wavelengths and um, you know what's available. So on the notion of that low cost, do you think that a red LED can replace uh, your laser? You know, is um, it possible? That's something that would be in definitely interesting to look at in the future. Um, since you know, if we if we, if we look at the cost breakdown of our device, um, the most expensive parts are the photo detector and um, the laser. So. It's something that we haven't looked into yet, um, but definitely something that would be interested uh, would be interesting to look into in the future is whether we can use you know an even lower cost light source and a lower cost power detector. Okay, and uh, what do you think? How far you are uh, away from taking your uh, uh, device to actual clinical settings? Um, I mean, first, we obviously have to go through animal studies. Um, so I think we're hoping to get the device um, to an animal study in the next like year or so. Um, you know, within, when, within the year, hopefully. Um, it'll be interesting navigating a cross-country uh, collaboration with COVID. Um, but we're hoping to get it into an animal study. And from there, obviously, you have to go through, you know, stages of clinical, uh, clinical studies. So as far as like actually getting it out there, you know, we're still probably looking at years. Um, but hopefully we'll be moving on to animal oh. studies. Great. So maybe last question for a few seconds. Uh, do you have a control to compare the results? I mean, a sample without malaria? Yes. Sorry. So I, I didn't mention that, um, but we're using essentially, um, you know, Sam was using either just, just polyethylene glycol or just whole, whole rabbit's blood. Um, you know, that hadn't been essentially doped with beta hematin. Um, in my case, since I was testing with iron oxide nanoparticles in water, I've been using just water as a control. Um, but, you know, eventually it would just be like a healthy blood sample versus a malaria infected blood sample. So great, Alexis, uh, and, and we look forward to seeing your device to actually in the clinical settings. Thank you very much uh, for your time and talk. Good luck. Thanks. Okay, so now we are moving to the last talk of the session, uh, uh, and it will be given by Siu Ju Bei. She is a PhD student uh, in electrical and electronics engineering department at RMIT University, Australia. And, and she's doing some outstanding work on, on using frequency combs based biosensors. So it's over to you, Siu Ju. Uh, Yes, thanks. I'm looking to share my screen. Just give me a second. Can you see my screen right now? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, um, right. Hi, everyone. My name is Sue, and I'm a PhD student here at Integrated Photonics Application Center at RMIT University, Australia. So today I'll be discussing the advantages of using optical frequency comb-based silicon photonic biosensor for the blood biomarker analysis, specifically in the context of heart attack from a biomedical scientist point of view. So I wanna start my talk uh, with a story. Nancy is a 58 year old woman who enjoys regular exercise. 
She eats healthily and has no known family history of any genetic disease. But one day she was rushed to the hospital. She had the symptoms of dizziness, um, sweating, and shortness of breath. So the doctors performed all sorts of tests on her, but they came back normal. They suspected that she was experiencing heartburn and possibly early menopause, but for the next week or so, her condition went from bad to worse. She continued to take the prescription that was given to her, but she was actually suffering from something called the silent heart attack. And this was only made known to her when she was admitted to the hospital a week later with her blood test showing signs of elevated troponin. Now in healthy individual, troponin levels are very low. When someone suffers from heart attack, the troponin is damaged from the is released from the damaged heart muscles and into the bloodstream. So nearly one in three patients with heart attack had other diagnosis at first medical contact. And this is especially more common in women compared to men. So it's very important for blood testing to be done as quick as possible because the longer a heart attack is left undiagnosed and untreated, the more the heart muscle can be permanently damaged. So with the conventional blood testing, <clears throat> if one were to consider the entire process, starting from taking the blood, to analyzing it and delivering the result to the hand of a clinician, it does take a long time. And Nancy might have not been so lucky if there was any delay between this process. So to streamline this, uh, researchers have turned their attention to a highly compact system known as lab on chip. The aim of a lab on chip is to really shrink the entire lab function into a chip using nanotechnology, where the analysis can be carried out in a fraction of time and in a way smaller scale. And this also led to the development of an alternative testing known as point of care. Point of care is a portable device that allows for really quick uh, diagnostic testing, but retains the sensitivity and the accuracy that rivals the conventional lab testing. So this is very useful and access to healthcare resources is limited. There are already troponin point of care out there in the market. They're not, they're not widely used because they're not really that reliable in terms of accuracy. Um, what makes a point of care uh, itself is the biosensor. So today we heard a lot of uh, biosensor from many incredible researchers. So what I really want to focus on is the Mark Sender in interferometer um, biosensor. So a Mark Sender typically consists of one splitter, one combiner, and two waveguides. So when the waveguide is split into two arms, one of the arms re uh, measures the refractive index change caused by the interaction of the bioconjugate. The other one serves as a reference that cancel out any non-specific interaction. The sensing occurs within the evanescent field, and this is how the output signal typically looks like. So whenever the interaction occurs within the sensing field, you will see a change in phase shift due to the change in refractive index. And this is proportionate to the concentration of a measured target. But there is one drawback to this. An interferometer needs to be biased for maximum sensitivity at the quadrature point. So bias drift exists, uh, which may be due to temperature or other factors, or very, very large signals can result to this bias to be shifted away from the point. So the further away it is, the less sensitive the measurement becomes. And when it hits the peak or the null of the curve, the sensitivity completely vanishes. And this becomes very difficult to distinguish between genuine bias interaction or if it's just a mere fluctuation of the light in center the sensor. And this becomes a major issue when dealing with complex samples such as blood because blood contains not just a biomarker of interest, but many other foreign particles that interferes with the reading of the sensor. Um, here is our silicon photonic biosensor platform. You can see this is how it looks like in the lab. Um, the silicon chip itself, uh, the layout is seen down here, is fabricated with an array of asymmetrical marks and the interferometer sensor. When I say asymmetrical, it just means that the, both the arms are not the same length. The sensor arm is actually way longer than the reference arm and it's coiled around to minimize the space it requires. So the longer the arm is, the more sensitive it is. Each of the sensor here can detect down to 10 to the power of minus seven refractive index units, which uh, correspond to picogram per mil measurements of the protein. So when the platform also has an integrated microfluidic device, I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of transparent. Um, that allows for automation and also multiplexing. So when we design the biosensor, we have to ensure that it can be developed into the point of care device. And it has to, uh, based on the international heart attack guidelines for it to be usable in clinical setting. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go through this. When we tested the biosensor systematically, we started from the bulk refractive index change using, using hydrochloric acid. 
we then tested whether the sensor is, um, when we immobilize the troponin antibody onto the, uh, the surface, we want to see if the antibody are binding to the surface. Uh, we also look for specificity. Uh, what this means that we want to make sure that uh, only troponin molecules are binding to the antibodies. And we, we use uh, other common protein that are found in blood to test this out. Finally, we also check for the sensitivity and the limit of detection using uh, different concentration of troponin. So what we found out that is that the biosensor is able to measure cardiac troponin, but the limit of detection did not reach 10 picogram per mil, which was the benchmark for, uh, for a point of care device. It also has a couple of shortcom uh, shortcomings from the photonic side of things. So number one, it's not that easy to use. One of the criteria of point of care is really the practicality as well. So currently the sensor needs to be biased and uh, calibrated at the quadrature point, and this step needs to be repeated every time a new measurement is started. The current readout method is also quite unstable because remember what I meant, I talked about the shift in the quadrature point, it's, it's happening quite frequently. Um, that's because it's very vulnerable to external factors such as temperature fluctuation. You can see here in this, uh, this graph, the, the temperature was shifting even though it's by a very small amount. Um, and every time, you know, every time I bump into the table, uh, when the system run, uh, running, I do see a huge change of refractive index. Um, the last limitation was the signal to noise ratio. We want to be able to achieve high signal and low noise because at higher power, the more sensitive the sensor is, but this also causes higher noise generation. We did a comparison with hydrochloric acid and troponin. So with a simple solution like hydrochloric acid, we can see clear change in bulk refractive index. We see very low um, signal to noise ratio here, but with complex solution like troponin, the noise to signal ratio become a bit hard to distinguish, especially at lower troponin concentration. Um, if you see it up here, this is 0 0.5 microgram per mil troponin, and we compared it to 0 0.01 micro microgram per mil. So the, uh, the baseline for the 0 0.5, when we introduce it to the sensor surface, we found that it doesn't return to the original baseline. That shows that it's actually, um, the troponin is actually binding to our antibody. But with 0 0.01 microgram per mil, we could barely distinguish the, both of the uh, baseline when the troponin was flowed to the sensor surface. So to overcome this limitation, we chose to use optical frequency comb technology to improve the signal processing method. So to my understanding, a frequency comb is a tool for measuring different frequency of light. It's like a ruler for light frequency, but in optical heads. So if you zoom into this optical spectrum here, you will see millions of little teeth, which are the optical pulses. Um, there will be a series of talk on uh, about uh, frequency comb after this, so I'll just leave the in-depth explanation to the experts. So the method we propose here is to use three laser lines from a single electro-optic frequency comb. They are split into three channels using a demultiplexer, and the detection is measured through three photo detectors and recorded over time. So the comb spacing is adjusted to sample the, uh, the spectral response at 120 degree interval. So whenever we see a change in refractive index, we see a sh same shift in phase occurring. But I like the default setup that I was using before that the measurements are taken at this interval. And all these three measure uh, measurements are then combined as a vector sum. And the angle of the resulting phaser is the phase we want to extract. So this way, we see a continuous and linear phase readout. And this um, is independent of a new bias drift. We look at three main parameters uh, when we set up the experiment. We want to see how this setup responds to very large signals. We want to see if it's robust and if it does reject any common, common mode signals. So we test out the responsivity of large signal using sodium chloride solution. Currently, I don't have any result on troponin because lab access were very limited during the lockdown here in Australia last year. So the troponin stuff are still work in progress. Uh, when the sodium um, sodium chloride solution will flow through the sensor surface, we did see a continuous and linear phase readout. And then we compared both of these methods and found that the, the extracted sensitivity and the noise were quite similar in value, but the signal to noise ratio were much lower for the comb. And this was to be expected because the inaccuracy of reading only comes from small signals at very low analyte concentration. Also keep in mind that sodium chloride is a much simpler solution compared to troponin. So this system um, does eliminate the very complicated um, manual phase extraction step that I mentioned before. We then look at how strongly the extracted phase signal is influenced by transmission power changes that are not caused by the operation of the sensor. For example, of factors that could influence this are 
misalignment or vibration to the fiber coupling of the photonic chip or fluctuations of the laser power. So the working principle of uh, the frequency comb uh, is shown in the diagram in the left here. So the comb, uh, the comb method combines three measured power value as a vector sum. And if you see here the in blue, the S here is the phase angle resulting phaser, which is the phase value we want to extract. So if there's any change in signal amplitude, we will see all three channels experiencing the same change in amplitude as well. But on the other hand, for the default single wavelength method, we found out that um, it's very reliant on the projection of the phaser S onto the real axis, which is shown in the red arrow. So any changes in amplitude become indistinguishable from changes in phase. And therefore, that's why the single wavelength phase method is very vulnerable to common mode noise and instability. So when we run the experiment, we, we did we change the input of power stepwise. So with the uh, default single wavelength method, we see that in the, the, the first graph on the E here, we find out that um, the, it changes linearly with the input of the power. And that was to be expected, while the extracted phase with the comb sampling method remains almost flat. And then when we introduce very large changes with the input power, we see that the single wavelength method immediately loses signal at about minus five dB uh, while the extractive phase for the comb sampling method remains quite constant until the minus 50 dB. And we, we showed, uh, we found, we conclude that the comb extraction method is actually suppressing the common mode noise by a factor of 100, about 120 compared to the single default uh, wavelength phase extraction method. So just to conclude, the optical comb processing method can be applied to any pre-existing interferometer and does not require any physical modification to the sensor design. And this can be applied to just about any blood biomarker based disease such as ovarian cancer and so forth, not just heart attack. There are a lot of works needs to be done to ensure our photonic bar sensor can be transformed into an acceptable point of care. We're looking at surface marginalization and deeper understanding of the troponin molecule itself. Um, finally, I'd like to acknowledge my group uh, impact at um, RMIT Australia. So I welcome any question. Um, just want to point out that I, I'm a biomedical scientist who works in a very multidisciplinary uh, team. I mean, might not be able to give very technical question, may, might not be able to answer very technical question about the optical frequency comb, but I'll give my best shot. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sue, uh, for such a nice talk. Uh, there are a few questions uh, for you. Uh, so I'll start with this. Uh, is there any dependence of uh, sensitivity or other parameters of your sensor on the VPI voltage? Sorry, can you say that again, the last bit? So is, is there any dependence of uh, VPI, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the sensor where you have a characteristic VPI voltage, where the sensor response becomes null? Uh, is there any dependence upon that voltage? Uh, not at the moment with the optical comb frequency method, but it does have it with the with the the, the single wavelength phase extraction method. Okay. Uh, uh, what is the working range of trip uh, triponin detection? How does this compare to clinical levels? So the working range we have right now is between 10 to 500 nanogram per mil, as seen in the slide here, and that's not good enough. The, for the clinical level, we want to, the limit of detection, we want it to be about less than 10 picogram per mil. The range, we, it has to cover from, yeah, from 10 picogram or even lower up to like very high value, like 500 nanogram per mil, because when somebody suffers from heart attack, it does goes up to about 100 to 200 nanogram per mil. Okay. Uh, there is another question. Uh, how did you measure noise uh, on your frequency combed biosensor system? How do I measure the noise? Yeah. So there is a, there was a, um, uh, a, some, uh, uh, a very complicated, um, what would I say, the, uh, uh, calculation that were used, but it's actually it's actually done um, by another student where we have he has written up a whole program for it, and we we if we would just transfer it into this program, it will be able to calculate it directly for us. So I I don't know how to explain that in a better terms. Uh, 
uh, there is another question. Uh, why didn't you use a reference asymmetric max zender to compress signal to noise ratio, uh, thermal and mechanical fluctuations? Sorry, it, it, it lacked that for me. So why do I not use asymmetrical max zender interferometer to you? You know, why not you apply a reference arm, you know, a typical technique uh, people do. Uh, oh, there for is a reference arm. That we actually do have a reference arm here, if I show you this. So. There is a reference arm. It's just shorter than the sensing arm. It is still a typical Mark Sender interferometer 